Um, we've been talking about prayer. Do y'all remember that? All right. We all on the same page? Um, so it's not going to come surprises. We're going to talk about prayer again today, but we're going to do it in a little bit different way, a little bit different context. Um, I want to take a look at a piece of scripture that we often overlook. We read through this and we go, man, that's a good story. And that's a powerful story. Um, but there's more to it. It's regarding the prayer of your church. It's regarding the prayer of this church. See, I'm convinced that God can do so far more for us, for this church, than we can ever imagine. Do you believe that? Yeah. Ephesians 3.20, you don't need to turn there, says this. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly and greatly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. What's the power that worketh in us? The Holy Spirit. Here's what that scripture is saying. Here's what I'm getting at today. God wants to do for us as a church far more than we could ever imagine. It's only going to happen when we come together in prayer. Let's get started with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for this church, your church, this family, your family. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to get together, as I said it before, just to honor, to glorify you. It, it's what it's all about. It has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with us taking anything away from today, but except us giving everything to you. So here we are today, excited to celebrate our Father. Lord, I thank you so much for that. Again, I, I talk and I, and I speak and ask about the Holy Spirit, Lord. Move over us. Calm our hearts and our ears. Our minds, Lord, to hear what you want to hear. Not what this preacher is talking about. In Jesus' name, amen. There's an insert in the bulletin. Grab that. The white one. It's got five, it says five prayer requests for our church. Grab that one. Put that out on your lap. Five prayer requests for our church. Five prayer requests for this church. Five prayer requests for Raleighville Gospel Church. That's also today's title. Five prayer requests for our church. Now, I purposely created this insert so you would take it home. Take it home, put it on the fridge, put it on the bathroom mirror, put it in the kitchen somewhere, put it out in the shop, somewhere where you're going to walk by it and remind you of today's message, remind you to pray for your church. Right now, you're probably thinking, well, what's wrong? What's wrong? Something wrong? What's going on in the church? Nothing. We're good. Nothing's wrong. But as a church, let me tell you something. We need this church, your church, needs daily prayer. Daily prayer to fight off the spiritual warfare that's going to come against us, that does come against us. I'm going to take a look at a scripture this morning, again, the one that we kind of overlook. We read this scripture, we read this story, and, and we think, man, that's powerful. That's, that's some good stuff. But how often do we really ask for discernment when we're reading God's word? And say, God, show me what it is that I'm reading. Lord, reveal to me what it is I'm reading. Turn with me to John 17. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 17. I'm going to start reading in verse 6. John 17, starting verse 6. If you got it, say amen. amen. Now, what does the, the header right there at the top of verse 6, what does that say? Jesus prays for his disciples. Now, I'm going to read all the way through verse 24. But look, take a look down there at verse 20. What does the header for that one say? Jesus prays for all believers. Who's all believers? 
Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago for his disciples. But who else was he praying for? Us. Let's read. 17, verse 6, it says this. I have revealed. Now, what did, let me back up. It's in red. So what's that mean? Jesus is saying this. So when I get started reading, it goes right into he is praying to God. This, what we're going to read today, is a prayer that Jesus Christ was praying to his Father. And he says this, he said, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I have gave them the words you gave me, and they accept, accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they're yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in this world no longer, but they are still in this world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. And while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. None has been lost except for the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture will be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas. Then he goes on in verse 13. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have, full, may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them. For they're not of this world and any more than I am of this world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They're not of this world, even as I'm not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into this world, I have sent them into the world. For I them sanctify myself, and they too may be truly sanctified. But he doesn't stop there. He's preaching, excuse me, he's praying for his disciples, for his followers. But he doesn't stop. He goes on to pray for us. He says this, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory and glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of this world. Jesus Christ prayed this prayer hours, just hours before he was crucified. Think about that with you. Think about that. He was Jesus Christ. He knew all. He knew what was coming. But he didn't pray over his circumstances, did he? He was praying over the disciples. And he was praying over this church. He was praying over you and me. Over 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ himself was praying for his church. But get this. In that moment, 2,000 years ago, before he went to the cross to die for you and me, he was praying for Raleighville Gospel Church. Jesus' prayer... For the church is an excellent model for us to follow when we pray for the church. When we pray for the leaders. When you pray for your pastor. I want to encourage you. I want to urge you. I want to ask you. I even want to beg you to pray for this 
church. Pray for your church. Pray for Raleighville Gospel Church. Do this on a daily basis. Use the example that Jesus Christ used over 2,000 years ago to pour out your prayer for this church. It can be summarized in five prayer requests. The insert that I put there, April actually put there in the bulletin. Again, hang it up somewhere in your house. Bathroom, mirror, kitchen, shop, wherever you're going to be at. And use this to pray for your church. Take a look at that very first prayer request. Pray that people would sense the glory of God. Take a look at verse 22. Again, it says this. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. That word glory in the Greek means the visible manifestation of the splendor and the power and the radiance of God. See, when Jesus prayed these words, his desire is that when we come together, when we meet together, that we would continually sense the splendor and the power and the radiance of God in our midst. That's why we pray what we pray. That's why I pray the Holy Spirit move over this place. Because when God's presence meets us, we're lifted up spiritually. And when that happens, when that happens, great things, powerful things happen. Do you believe that? The problem we run into is too many Christians come to the service preoccupied with life's problems. We come to church focused on what we've got going on. We come to church focused on that to-do list. The priorities, what this week's going to hold. Instead of clearing our minds and clearing our hearts for the sole purpose of coming to church just to praise your Father. Too many times we come preoccupied with life's problems. Not focused on what we can give to the service. That's what praise, that's what worship is. is when you give everything over to God. Don't worry about what you're going to get from the service, but rather, what are you giving to the service? Come focused in that day, on this Sunday morning, come focused on God. Not because, well, you know what, that's where the car takes me on Sunday. You come focused, you come prepared. Your heart is prepared before you even get here to give God honor. To give God the glory that He deserves. And when that happens, and when we as a family, when we as a church can do that, and we come prepared, let me tell you, powerful things happen. I believe that when a church really worships, and I mean worship. When we worship, and when people really come, Pleasing to seek God, to have fellowship with God, and also have fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. It draws non-believers in like a moth to the flame. It becomes contagious. People outside the church, they're going to be intrigued. They're going to be curious. They're going to be moved to see what in the world is going on in that church. There's something powerful going on in that church. Well, I, I got to figure out what's going on. You see, the real value of a church. It's not the facilities. It's not these four walls. Get this real value of a church. It ain't your pastor. It's not the programs. As church. It only has a value when Jesus Christ is meeting with the people. That's what makes the difference. Are you praying for it? That's what that first prayer request means. Are you praying for it? John 12, 32 says this. When I am lifted up. And that's Jesus Christ talking again. He says, when I am lifted up. 
I will draw all men unto myself. When we are lifting God up, when we are doing nothing but focused on the glory of God and honoring God and praising God, Jesus Christ Himself says, then I'll draw all men to myself. So I ask you in that first prayer request, pray that we would want to be consumed by the glory of God. Not just see a little bit of, I said consumed with the glory of God. Second prayer request, pray that we would follow the word of God. Now right here, it's very easy for you to hear that and go, what? What do you mean? Y'all don't follow the word of God? No, it goes much deeper than that. Look at verse 8, it says, For I have given to them the words which you gave me, and they have received them. Let me tell you something, when a church, or when a people in a church are continually studying, when a people in a church are continually learning, when a people in a church are continually growing in the Word of God, they become changed. You can't help but become changed. As people, we realize that the Word of God is relevant to us. Our lives take on a whole new meaning. Our values change. Our character changes. Our mind changes. Our thoughts change. You know how I know that? Look at the example of what happened to the disciples. Look at the example of Peter. When the disciples received the word of Jesus, it gave their lives meaning. It gave them motivation. It put them on a mission. And it changed their lives. That's what Jesus desired for his disciples more than 2,000 years ago. And let me tell you something, church. It's what his desire is for us. So I urge you, pray that we as a church would follow and continue to follow the Word of God. That we as a whole would grow in the Word of God. Take a look at that third prayer request. Pray that we would be united in the love of God. Jesus prays there in verse 23 that we, He says this, He says that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Here's what Jesus is saying in that. It's a little wordy. Here's what he's saying. Jesus is praying for the unity among believers. Jesus was praying that all believers be unified through the love of Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because spirit-filled Christians... United in love, guided by purpose, directed by the Holy Spirit, can do anything. Do you believe that? Spirit-filled Christians, united in love, guided by purpose, directed by the Holy Spirit, can do anything. Do you remember what I talked about last week? The power of prayer. Let me tell you something. When we're united, we come together in prayer, we can shake the gates of hell. There's nothing we can't do. We come together as children of God, devoted to Him, moved by the Holy Spirit. You and I, we together can shake the gates of hell. But when a church is divided and it ain't united, it's powerless. And when that happens, it can't take care of its own people. It can't be an effective witness to the people outside of the church. And it can't fulfill God's purpose for that church. Thank God for the unity that we have here. Thank God. But let me tell you something. Unity don't reach a plateau and you just stop. Unity is a process that is always growing. And as God grows this church, things happen. You want me to tell you what happens when the Holy Spirit's moving and God in the church? Satan will try to divide you. Satan will do anything he possibly can to try to break you up. Put a, put a un, 
divide us. Excuse me, divide us. The lack of unity. That's how the devil works. He will come against a church when the church is impacting Christ. You know how to know whether you're working in the direction that God wants you to go? The enemy is going to come against you. Because you're impacting this world for Christ. And the enemy, Satan, he will come against you. He will rage war against the church to keep them from hurting his ultimate plan. And the most effective way, the biggest way, the number one way that Satan does that is creating animosity, bitterness, grudges, arguments, gossip, backstabbing between the members in a church. His number one way to come against the church is to break that unity. He knows that if he can break the unity in that church, then they won't be able to feel, fulfill God's plan, not just for their life, but for the life of that church. And they cannot take more people to heaven. If you're in a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-moving church, I'm going to tell you something. Satan's going to want to come against you. Satan should be coming against you. And you should be like, you know what? That's all right, because I got God on my side. But you don't allow people, you don't allow yourself to divide or come against that unity. When that happens, you pray. And you pray before that happens. You pray that this church, your church, Raleighville Gospel Church, will be united in the love of God. And that will continue to grow and continue to grow in that unity. Pray for that hedge of protection around the church because of the spiritual warfare that takes place. I talked to you, uh, was it last week? When Daniel, and they, we, we got to pull, see what Daniel was going against and dealing with, with that spiritual warfare that happens all around. We live in the physical, but there is spiritual warfare raging all around us. And I'm going to tell you what, something. Satan wants to come against this church. Satan wants to, because any time that you are impacting unbelievers, we've got so many different programs going right now because we've prayed for it. God said, all right, here we go. Get ready. Put your shoes on. We're going to run. And you know what happens? Satan's going to come against it. When you are moving in your life in the direction that God wants you to go, Satan's going to come against you. I prayed hard not to be a preacher because I knew what was going to happen. I'm going to be fulfilling God's plan for my life. I'm going to be impacting non-believers. And I knew in that moment that Jesus Christ could be my only protection. And the devil was going to wage war on me, was going to rage war on my family, was going to rage war on this church. But you know what that allowed me to do? Depend on God even more. That's us. That's what we do as a church. We depend on God even more and we pray against it. Take a look at that fourth prayer request. Pray that we would go forth in a mission of God or in the mission of God. That comes from verses 17 and 18. It says this. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world. What's that last part say? I also have sent them into the world. The word sanctify here means to be set apart. To be equipped for a special mission. You as a Christian have been equipped for a special mission. You, we as a church, as a family have been equipped for a special mission. You say, well, what's that mission? That we might leave these four walls of this church and go back into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ and how much he loves us. Take a look at the bottom of the first page in your bulletin. Open it up. Look all the way down to the very bottom. What's that say at the very bottom? Somebody shout it out. Departure to serve. This tells us. This bulletin tells us what's happening today. But it doesn't stop today, does it? When this service is over, we depart to serve. That's what that means. 
Oh, we need the prayer that we never lose sight of that is this church. That should be a continual prayer. That we never forget the reason why we exist. Everything that we do as a church, everything that we do as a Christian is for a purpose, is for a reason, so that we might win the lost to Christ. So pray for that boldness. Pray for that courage. Pray for that strength. Pray for more of the Holy Spirit to take the good news of Jesus Christ outside of these four walls. That fifth prayer request comes from verse 13. Pray that we would experience the joy of God. He says this, he says, I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in this world so that they may have the fullness. Excuse me, the full measure of my joy within them. Notice that Jesus Christ is praying for us. Praying for the disciples. And he says, I'm coming to you now, talking to his father. But I say these things while I'm still in this world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. It doesn't say, hey, God, give them joy. What does it say? The full measure of my joy. He ain't holding back. He wants us to have joy that we have, no, have never experienced. And it's possible. He wants us to have his full measure of joy. So... What gives the church joy? Obedience. Obedience to God and the things that we just talked about. Obedience in those five prayer requests. Giving God the glory, number one. Following in His Word. Being united in love and carrying that mission out beyond these four walls. You want joy in your life? You like joy in your life? Get started there. Pray for yourself, absolutely, but pray for your church. The prayer request that I just spoke about, those five prayer requests, will bring you joy, will bring this church joy. And they're only possible. That joy is only possible as we come together and pray for our church. I believe that our church can be transformed. I do believe that. I believe that we have not come close to the potential that God has in store for us. And that happens through men and women, youth and children, praying for the church. Praying for the leaders, praying for your pastor. So I ask you, would you commit to pray for your church, for the leaders, for me as a pastor? Would you meet together and spend time in prayer? Now think about this. It's easy to say, Donnie, yes, I'm going to pray for the church. But how often do we think or say, you know what? I'm going to get a hold of a few people today. Now, hey, are, are you busy about 12 o'clock? Let's, let's just get together and pray for the church. Don't wait for the pastor or a deacon or somebody to say, hey, let's have a, a, a prayer vigil. Don't wait for Pam and the ministerial committee to talk about a prayer vigil. You, as individuals, as members of this church, you get together. You allow the Holy Spirit to move through you. Look for the discernment of the Holy Spirit that says, hey, you know what? God's putting it on my heart to get a couple people together in my home, at the coffee shop, at the Greenway. Let's just sit down and pray. Let's just pray over this church. You know what? We've had a heavy week. Next week's going to be really heavy. A lot going on. A lot going on. Why don't we just get together, a few of us, and pray about what's going on? You don't have to have the preacher a part of that prayer meeting. Reach out to a few of you. A few of the friends. Some new people. Some visitors. And say, hey, can you meet? Can we meet together? Can we pray over our church? Let me tell you something, when you get together and you start praying together for your church, God moves in a powerful, powerful, powerful way. So I ask you, would you lift up the church in prayer? Would you lift up the leaders of the church in prayer? Would you lift up the pastor in prayer? Not just on Sundays. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Use this. 
this little bulletin, this little handout. Stick it somewhere in your house to remind you to pray over your church. Let me tell you something. When we as a congregation, when we as a people, when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. Let's close in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much for who you are. Lord, I thank you so much that when we as Christians, as believers, as your children come together in prayer, in unity, we can pray and shake the gates of hell. That's how powerful our prayers are. Lord, lay it on our heart. Wake us up at night to pray and pray even more. Talk to you even more. Pray for our church. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.